Tell me some things that we value as human beings in this world. Secular world, maybe. What do we hold of value? What's that? Uh, our house, our property, car. I need a nice car. I want, I want a red convertible sports car so that my hair can just flap in the wind and um, not to the point it comes off the top of the head or anything like that, but I really want a sports car. I mean, a car, what does that communicate? It communicates what? Power! What? Make sure we do not put that on film. I drive a minivan. I, I, that, that can't possibly talk to me. Do you think that we in, the, in our culture today, we, we, we value power? Position, maybe? Authority? What is the first thing somebody will ask you when they meet you? What do you do for a living? Why do we do this? Do we really care? I, I, I have a theory. I think that the question comes about because we don't realize how much we value power and position. But that first question, the very first thing that we ask somebody, really tells us what? A lot about the person. The minute you ask that question, you know what? They make, kind of. You know maybe their education level. You know, are they position of authority or something less, correct? I encourage you, I really do, to mess with people when they ask you what you do. Annie, jot this down. You're the type of person who, who would do this. When somebody asks you what you do, lie to them. Now, I know I'm going to get in trouble. I know I'm going to, well, I'm telling you to do it. I don't want to do it because lying is wrong. So tell them you own your own business. And just watch that. I own my own business. I'm not done with the deception. Okay. It goes further. But watch. I own my own business. Watch how their eyes light up. Watch how that level of respect goes up to you. Watch how the questions continue. The follow-up question is, oh, really? What type of business do you own? You tell them you own a porta potta cleaning business. <laughs> you don't have any employees. Nobody's hiring you, but you're practicing a lot. Watch how fast... <laughs> what? Watch how fast the conversation ends. They will then move on to the most common topic that most people start talking about. What is it? The weather. I get offended when people talk, start talking about the weather because they're done with you. What do you do? I'm a writer. Really? What type of books do you write? Have you ever met the lady who wrote the Twilight series? Are, are, are you published right there? But say something like, I run a hot dog stand and they immediately go to something else. Weather sure has been nice here lately. <laughs> this generally means I'm done with you and you no longer are of any interest to me. Again, I get offended when people talk about the weather. What are you saying? Huh? It happens a lot. Power, position. What about wisdom and intelligence? Do we value wisdom and intelligence? As long as somebody agrees with us. <laughs> You know, I believe that there are times where people can say something extremely stupid and we give them homage just because of the title that they have. I think that we do. We give people wisdom. I, I, I mean, I think we look up to it. Um, there's a story. Uh, uh, it, it's not a real story, so this is not gospel. It's not scripture. But there was a, a dean who was having a meeting, and all the faculty members were there, and they were all around them. And immediately behind him, an angel appeared. And the dean turned around, and the angel looked down upon him and says, I'm here to grant you one of three things. Would you like infinite wisdom, extreme beauty, or infinite wealth? And without missing a beat, the dean says, I want infinite wisdom. And the angel lifted up his wings and said, bam, done, poof, went away. 
Smoke appeared and lightning crashed out. Immediately, the faculty looked up at, at, at this dean and he had this halo around him as if wisdom was just emanating from his head. And they were just waiting for him to say something. And he wouldn't say anything. Finally, one of the faculty members stepped up and said, say something. And now with, with infinite wisdom, he says, you know, I should have taken the money. <laughs> that's all I got. That's the joke that I have. So if you came for the humor, that's it. <sighs> um, what? No, but I'm setting you up. It comes back in so later. I'm not against power and position. I am a conservative, John, so I don't, I know. They're not all bad. People with power and position can do a lot of good things. Can they not? Uh, you wouldn't have the Gospel of Luke. Well, you would. I'm, I'm sure that you would have. But the Gospel of Luke was made possible. The Gospel of Acts was made pop, possible behind, I don't have any money, I don't have any money, but I'll give somebody a prize. Who can tell me who made, who funded it? Who funded the book of Acts and Luke? Oh, come on. Who funded Acts and Luke's? Very good, John. It was Theophilus. I'm going to, hold, hold on, John. Let me, John, could you come up here? So I, I got to give you an award, so let's just go ahead here real quick. And let's go ahead and rotate that. And let's go ahead and just, hold on. There you go. There you go, new Facebook picture. So you can put that online there, so I'll send that to you. Make sure I put that on the Facebook. Theophilus, he was a very wealthy individual. He was a, a person of power, and he funded the books to be written. So Luke was a historian. He'd, he'd go around. So I'm not against p people of position or power. Um, I'm really not against wisdom or intelligence. There is a famous person in the Bible, you tell me, I know you guys can get this pretty quick. Who was the famous person in the Bible who God said, I'll give you whatever you want. Uh, what would you like? Would you like beauty? Would you like wisdom? Would you like wealth? Would you like long life? And the king responded, I want wisdom. Who was that? Solomon, Solomon King Solomon. Okay. And it was because who got that? That was Dan, right? Dan, do you have a Facebook? <laughs> would you like a picture of you and I together right here? <laughs> He's got wisdom. There he goes. He said it. Dan, congratulations. You have been awarded all the chips that we have here at this church. Enjoy. Um, but it was. King Solomon said, he said, I want the wisdom. And then God said, because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give it to you. Plus, I'm going to give you what? Long life. Long life. Riches and fortunes, which seems to me it's a narration. I know my, my, my narrator back there, uh, Greg, uh, inside joke. But God, it seems to me that wisdom is a greater thing to desire than the wealth, than the long life. And that's why God reward him. I mean, you put it into context, it seems that. So I think that wisdom is good. But that story that I just told you is that, is that sometimes there are... Are there competing wisdoms out there, do you think? Competing wisdoms out there? That maybe sometimes somebody, there, there'll, be, there'll be one group of people that says, you know what, having wisdom is, is the better, but there are some people out there who think maybe having an infinite amount of money is a lot better. I mean, have, have you ever heard competing wisdoms that seem to conflict against each other? Yeah. There are. There's... The Bible talks about different types of wisdom. I was looking at, uh, up at the scripture. Um, does the Bible promote good wisdom? Absolutely, but at the same time, it says, watch out. Proverbs 3, 7 says this. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. There is such thing as a worldly wisdom and a godly wisdom. Go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Last week we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 10 through 17. Can anyone tell me what the, the heart of the matter was last week? 
division. Very good, you were listening. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18, the Apostle Paul is going to, is, is going to go off what, would, what, what some might would consider to be a rant. Here he was talking about division. Didn't, what did we conclude last week? Is division okay for, uh, on the inside of the church? Is it okay to be divided on things? Yay, nay. We can, we can have disagreements, right, Krista? We can say that, that I believe that uh, we need to be doing one thing and the other person the other thing, but we're all seeking God's will. But ultimately, we need to be what? Unified on different things. We need to be unified on what God says um, on different areas of theology. We need to really be unified on what Christ says is right and what Christ says is wrong. We need to be on the same page there, so we need to be unity. But Paul isn't saying that we need to be unified at all times. There are things that we need to have disagreements on. One of the things that we need to disagree on is sometimes there are two forms of wisdom. One, a godly wisdom. Two, a worldly wisdom. So let's go ahead and read the text here together, and we'll just kind of break it apart. By the way, this is not going to be a long message. I know my family, are you guys, where are you guys going today? Uh-huh. Ohio. Cedar Point. Is that, that's a amusement park. You're not taking any of your parents? <laughs> you know, do you love them? Do, can I go? And are saying, no, no, no. Huh? We could take our van. <laughs> yeah, I've been ditched before. First Corinthians 1, verse 18 says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand a miraculous sign and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. I am going to break that down, but let me give you the main point of today's message. There are different types of wisdom out there. The Christian, that's you guys and gals, embraces a wisdom that the world will reject. The Christian simply embraces a wisdom the world will reject. One more time, a Christian embraces a wisdom the world reject. Likewise, the world embraces a wisdom the Christian should reject. Let's break that down. Worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. Hmm. I, I don't want to go into different philosophies or anything like that, but um, uh, I, I, I just got into a, an argument. You guys do know that arguments are okay. It wasn't a screaming match or anything. With a person here, um, uh, I was actually ministering to them, and uh, as I was helping them out with a material need that, that they had, I also wanted to provide a spiritual need because I believe at the heart of a lot of our material needs is we have, a, we have some spiritual issues. This person was outside of the grace of God. They, were, they, they, just, they, they don't believe, they've embraced the world's faith, the, 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 the worldly idea, and I was trying to tell them about Jesus Christ. And, and, and I quoted a passage in the Bible that says that apart from um, Jesus, um, you simply can't be saved. They were extremely offended. They looked at me as they were taking the stuff that I was giving them, and they called me an arrogant SOB. I, a sob. 
They spelled it out for me. I used the acronym. Son of a biscuit eater. What were you thinking? Huh? Same thing. Good. This side of the room was thinking something else because they're heathens. They called me arrogant because I believed that there was an absolute truth. And they said that there is no such thing as an absolute truth. And I said, well, well do you know the truth? And they said, absolutely not. I do not know the truth. And then I said to them, well, why in the world would I listen to somebody who is admittedly ignorant of anything. It is the culture that we live in, though. There is a worldly philosophy that says there is no such thing as truth, and they embrace any type of ideas of trace. Worldly wisdom is also a constant change. I like 1 Corinthians 1.20. It says this, where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Worldly wisdom is in constant change. Somebody, do you know the breakdown of Plato, what Plato thought? Does anybody know Plato? John, you know Plato. What does Plato think? What was his idea? The allegory of the cave. Tell everybody quickly. You got 12 seconds. What we see is not really real. It's not really real, but it's what? It's, uh, it, it's an image, an illusion of some sort of reality. And what you need to do is you need to escape the cave and look at the reality, and you'll be able to see what is absolutely true. Philosophers to this day, do they hold true to what Plato says? Do, do you find Platonian philosophers out there? Okay, there's probably a few. But for the most part, has it been rejected? Yeah. Does anyone here study Plato philosophy? No. Sigmund Freud had what? Three different... He, he, stand up. Okay, John, stand up. Quick, 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 quick. Okay. Inside, can I tell you what's inside of John? Can you see? I'm sorry, we're moving around. Okay, stand up here. John, John is a conflicted individual. This is Sigmund Freud. He has in him an id. That's it. He knows the philosophy. He, he has the id. Let's, let's see the id. Oh, the id only knows one of two things. The id wants to kill. Not me. Look at somebody that you want to kill. The id wants to kill. And at the same time, make love. <laughs> These are your, your inner personal beast, but it's kept under control over what? The ego. Inside John, there's an ego that's telling the id what to do, where the id says, kill that person. You've all been driving down the street, haven't you? You've, you've, you've gotten behind somebody. You, you've gotten behind my son, Andrew, who's trying to drive right now, and he's hitting the brakes a little bit too fast and not smoothing it in, he's real jerky, and you just want to kill him. Well, the ego inside of you, maybe that's just me, the <laughs> ego inside of you says, do not kill the boy. It should say, do not kill the boy. And on top of the ego, there's something else. What is it? It's the super ego. The super ego tells the ego. Now, you don't know what the super ego says because you can no longer hear or even understand the super ego, but it's there. It was your daddy. Your daddy told you things, and now your daddy becomes the super ego in your subconscious mind that's telling your ego and the conscious mind to keep control of the id. Brilliant, is it not? No! No psychologist to this day. Sit down for a second. We'll, we'll pull you back up. For the most part, other than maybe a few wackos out there, people have rejected this type of philosophy. It really is a philosophy more than it is a psychology. It's constantly under change right there. Worldly wisdom also does this. It embraces what? Power, strength, and rejects witness. Are you of any use to me? You know, it's funny, we could, we could talk about philosophy, and I'll bore the pants off you right now, but what's sad is the philosophy in the world shapes your very behavior, and most people don't even realize that, and, and that's kind of sometimes what's sad out there. There's a philosophy out there that talks to us, and, and, and we listen to it, and it shapes the world. Um, I was 
just reading an article the other day about um, how, um, and, and it's really based on this men mentality. I don't, I don't know if it's based out of evolution or if it's based out of just um, hedonistic values or, or this power struggle right there, but babies now are being tested in the womb for one thing in particular. You know what it is? What is it? Downs. Downs. What, what is the response to when, what do you think the overwhelming response is to finding out that you are pregnant with a Downs child? It, it's really high. It's really high. And I hate to say that, but that's kind of like how the philosophy shapes things. So when I say that philosophy embraces strength and, and power and rejects weakness, you know, that has real life implications in your life. There is a philosopher out there. He's my favorite philosopher. Randy, I, I'm looking for a book. I let somebody borrow my Frederick Nietzsche book, and he's a philosopher. He's an atheist philosopher. One of you's got it. I don't know who it is. I'm thinking it's Marcia. Just throwing that out there. And I'm going to come to your house and I'm going to check to see if you got that. Randy calls it kindling. Okay, it's, it's just, it's, it's good kindling, which is probably right, but it, it's, it's philosophy. It sounds like great wisdom. If you were to quote him in college, you guys would get an A just because, oh, you read Friedrich Nietzsche, you're brilliant. But um, it, it, it's amazing. He took a worldview of evolution, of natural, that there is no God, and he turned in a philosophy that was consistent with um, that type of mentality. And... Frederick Nietzsche would argue that he's a weak individual because he has compassion on weak people. And because of that, John, in, from an evolutionary point of view, is brain damaged. Now, most of us, amen, we know that, we know that, but he's still got this loving characteristic. Nietzsche would argue that you're all brain damaged. Why? Because you care for weak species. You care for people who, who, who can't help that. They need to be X'd out. You can sit down. Okay. Is that crazy? Hitler didn't think so. Frederick Nietzsche was a German philosopher. Hitler was the guy who came back, embraced his philosophy, and brought it down. It is. It, it, it is. We embrace the, the strong, and, and we reject the weak. But I've already showed you that you guys do the same thing. Every time you ask somebody, what is it that you do? You're really trying to find out where along on this, on this ladder they are. Are, are they powerful? Do, do we need to respect them? Do we need to listen to them? Are they an authority figure? Are they valuable in our life? Or are they somehow beneath us? Are they weak right there? So it is a philosophy that the world does. It is. They embrace that. Sigmund Freud, we were talking about Sigmund Freud. He says that your faith, your religion, your Christianity is one of two things. It is an illusion... Or it is a narcotic. We had a wonderful saint pass away. And I'm so glad, this is from Sigmund Freud, that you have your Christianity so that you can ease your pain. Or it is a crutch. Because you people are so weak in life, so you can't handle it. You need this Christianity to get you through life. How many of you heard that? Your faith is, it's a crutch. Because worldly wisdom doesn't need it. Especially in America today. We're individuals. I bet there's people in here right now that's going through problems and they're not saying anything to the rest of the church because, well, that's just not what we do because we're strong. Well, you've embraced worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom. It changes it embraces that all, all, there's all types of different truces. It embraces power and strength and it rejects weakness. Mm. What about godly wisdom? Godly wisdom runs so contrary to the worldly wisdom that I don't think that you can rece receive the information, you can receive the same outcome. What do I mean by that statement right there? There are people out there that says that um, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and it doesn't really matter. It ends up in the same place. I reject that idea. 
Christianity, and you're going to see this here, has, has a philosophy that runs so counterculture, and the world runs so counterculture to, to um, the different mindsets and the different directions that you can't possibly end up in the same place. You can't possibly end up in the same place. Let's look at some of them. Number one, uh, Christianity is not, or the, the godly wisdom is never changing. It's still here. 1 Corinthians 1.20, ask where the wise man is. But when you look at what God says, he says, you know what? I'm the same. I'm the same yesterday. I'm the same today. I'm the same tomorrow. It's never changing. It always applies. Number two, godly wisdom embraces the gospel. What do I mean by that? We, we read that right here. Genesis, the sin of man. You had this, at the time, angel appear before Adam and Eve. And he promised Adam and Eve something that he desired. And Adam and Eve turned around and said, I desire the same thing. And they sinned. That thing was to be great like God. We like power we like authority we ascend to it what makes this church great what this church is great if it's what big god's blessing a church when they're big powerful but that is the opposite In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things that were created were created through him. He spoke everything into existence. This is the Word. John 1 and 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. He was born into poverty. He left his glory, he came to earth, born of a man, a, a mere creation, an animal in some, some people's point of view, to a family that needs to be on wick. And then with that, he grew up to be a regular worker, a carpenter. That's it. A ministry that lasted three years, got really big for a while, got really small for a while, everyone abandoned him. And then he was executed. He died. He gave up his life. Why? Because God told him to do it. People would come up to him. The rich man had all kinds of stuff. Said, tell me, what must I do? And Jesus looks at him and says, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, follow all the commandments and you get to go to heaven. The rich man says, well, I don't know. I, th I think I'm following them all, but what else must I do? Something else is missing. So one thing's missing. You still got all this wealth. Why don't you give it away? And then follow me. The rich man was sad. I was with the church one time, and they, and they were doing this. They were doing this. I said, okay, we, we're, we're, we, we got to figure this out. We're, we're, the, the, the numbers just aren't there, and we got this big church. We've got to pay for the building. So we need to pray about what we are and pray about who it is you know, that we're to represent, and we can start reaching this. So we all prayed and everything, and then, and then the, the lead team came back and says, okay, here's what we are. Here, here's what we are best suited for. We are best suited based on the people that we have that we can reach out to middle class, upper class families who's got like 3.2 kids and, 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 and they make about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. They're living in a pretty affluent neighborhood, maybe just a little bit less affluent. That's who we're called to reach out to. I know, well, Randy's always preached. He's called to reach out to the millionaires in Hawaii, but, and, and he wants you to fund his missions trip, by the way. But then when I read the gospel, it's like, it doesn't seem consistent with kind of who God was reaching out to. I don't, I don't know. It's just, here, let me, let me read a passage to you. You ready? 1 Corinthians 1, 26, all the way to chapter 2. He's talking to Corinthians. 
Brothers, think of what you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that one may, no one may boast for him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom of the world. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Therefore, it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here you have God who was king, who was king over all creation, the Alpha, the Omega, the first, the last, the great I am, making himself the, the son, making himself nothing, taking the very form of the man, being obedient to the Lord, being a homeless guy who eventually was crucified so that he could save people right there. And the people that he were called, he called prostitutes. He called the destitute. He called the poor. He called the people that were rejects. He called the destitute. He called the wealthy too. I'm not saying that. But you go into the blessings, is blessing of the weak. Blessed, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. I was with a unit in the Marine Corps. We had this really cool thing right there. On the, and we had this cool jacket. And our company is called the Black Sheep. Black Sheep Bravo. It was like every... Every reject that came to the company got sent to Bravo Company. I was there by accident. But everybody else, <laughs> I just thought of that. I was like, wait a second, I was in that company. Um, maybe, maybe it's just not true. We are Christian. We're the rejects of this world that embraces power. You, you're rejects. You go out in the world, hi, I'm a Christian. You're, the response you get it should be this, some weather we're having. Think it'll rain? You're rejects. Our Savior was a reject. I don't know, if, unless you read something different than I do. Does that offend you? Eh, maybe you got a pride thing. I'm okay. Wisdom of man rejects God. Two points, and then I'm going to close with two ideas. The wisdom of man rejects God by nature. It says in the Bible that our ways are not his ways. But I also think that the nature of God, the wisdom of God, is rejected by man. This would be the second reason I think it is, is because it is by design. If you could understand and if you could somehow, through study and diligent um, reading and based on your intelligence, eventually come to conclude that God is who he says he is, you have somehow earned that. And it says in this text, you know what? It's so that no man can boast. You embrace your Christianity. You embrace the message of the gospel because God has revealed it to you. That's it. Any of you who get arrogant in your Christianity, in your belief system, think yourself better than somebody who hasn't embraced it yet, don't understand God's grace. You don't understand what God has given you. You understand because God has revealed it to you, period, so that you can't boast. It was given to you. Here are the two implications real quick. You should, one, you should never get upset that the world rejects what you embrace. You should never get upset that the world rejects what you embrace. I've told this story before. I was at a wedding one time. I think it was Eric and Kim Pilashevsky's. I was marrying them. They, they, they felt obligated. They invited me out to dinner. I went out to dinner, sat me right in front of, of Cousin Bob, who happened to be this brilliant teacher who totally rejected anything Christian. Sat me right in front of him. And, and then he just like puts down water and food right there. It's like, hey, that's my Uncle Bob. Why don't you talk to him? I told him what I did. He said, Really, really, you're a pastor. 
tell me about your walk. I mean, you know, in this kind of like you just want to knock them out kind of mentality. I'm okay. I'm, I'm a Christian, so I didn't knock them out. I love them. So I was loving on him, and I was telling him, says, well, you know what, I was an atheist. Before, I didn't believe, and, and, and you know what, God called me, and then there was still a bunch of problems and stuff I had to kind of work out. So here I am, a believer now, and I had all these objections, and I started reading and studying. And the more I read and studied, the more I'm like, man, God is who he says he is. It says it right here in the Bible, and the Bible says this. All this stuff is written so you believe, and I started studying, and I felt like, like God was just showing me the truth. And he goes, that's very interesting. Most people... As they read and become smarter, they reject the foolishness of religion and embrace naturalism. It's like, dude, I'm right here when you said that. I mean, it was just like, uh, it kind of ticked me off. And then I did. I, this was, you know, my younger spiritual days. I started trying to hammer them and start getting a fight and in, in a godly way fight. Not, not a Miss Annie, I'm beating you down fight, but more in a like, you know, I love you and this is why you're stupid. Somebody calls me stupid. I like to, for whatever reason, I've got this prideful thing that I want to try to make them look stupid. Okay? It, it, that's a sinful thing. Why? The Bible told me. They're going to think it's foolishness. You mean prideful? Let me think about it real quick. Who's got a 16-year-old daughter? Anyone right now here? Jesse, you do not have a 16-year-old daughter. Andrew, you're like 18, right? If my son comes up to me and says, Dad, yes, son, let me talk to you. What, son? The girl I'm seeing, yes, son, pregnant. Don't worry, Dad. What? Miracle. <laughs> I'm as shocked as you are. Had a dream. How should I respond? May I still kill him? I probably would, Jesse, in love. That's the story we tell. Two thousand years now. Well, there's prophecy, and I mean, it didn't. This wasn't just a shock. There's this prophecy that led up to this. How about this? Hey, there's some homeless guy out there. He doesn't have a place to live, but man, he's a pretty good teacher. I'm thinking about just leaving my career, my job, and I'm just gonna follow this guy around for three years. Okay, come with me. Come on, let's go together. We can do this. What are you gonna say? He's homeless. He's got no place to lay his head. Worked in a graveyard. Did for a number of years. What would you think if I came here and I was like, uh, do you remember that Joseph Smith? Grave's been opened, body's gone. He'd risen from the dead. Let's start a club. That's foolishness to the world. And it says it is to them. But we don't have to be embarrassed by it. That's what faith is. I trust them. I mean, if there was a natural explanation for it, well, then it wouldn't be by God, would it? I mean, well, I mean, natural is still by God. But if somebody comes up to you and says, well, I just have a natural explanation of, of what really happened behind the whole uh, Mary and Joseph story, doesn't it lose its power? I mean, yes, God's going to go against. It's very, it is foolishness. But we don't have to be afraid of it. Number two, as Christians, we must resist the temptation to disguise the wisdom of God with the wisdom of the world. What do I mean by that? We are so, we've got this, I don't know, it's, it's part of our sinful nature, but we want to be loved by people. We want people to accept us and embrace us. And here we are, we're believing this foolishness stuff of the Bible that, oh my goodness, he created in six days and, and, and Jesus literally walked on wild. I mean, they're, they're praying. Uh, how many of you thought, I mean, if I said, bring somebody to church next week, and you're like, okay, I'm going to bring something to church. It's like, oh, I wonder what Pastor Mike's going to talk about. Oh, better not bring anybody to church. He's probably going to be some crazy stuff. What you talking about next week? Possession of demons. Okay. Yeah.
I have a favorite, I'm not going to mention the guy's name, but one of my favorite politicians um, was asked one time who his favorite philosopher was. And he said, Jesus Christ. He says, why was he your favorite philosopher? And the guy who said this wasn't looking at Jesus as a philosopher, but as a savior. And he goes, he, he saved me. And I thought, man, that's pretty powerful. That's, that's good. I like hearing that from somebody. I hope he meant it. You know, people can blow smoke. They can lie to you. But it was later on in this guy's service that he was standing there, and he was asked, what about the Muslims? And there you got the camera in front of the guy. And you got the whole world watching him. And is he president of just the Christians? Here, I told you what the guy was. Okay, it doesn't matter which pre if he was a president or is he a senator. I know, I'm not very bright. He was in charge of everyone. So here he's been asked a spiritual question, and he has to answer. And what does he say? Their way is the truth. My way is the truth. You know, it's all the same God. Well, let me ask you, how would you answer that, though? 